Well, good morning, church. I'm Pastor Jeremy. Thanks so much for being with us. If you're online, uh, a big welcome to you. And I, uh, apparently, we have a crowd of students in Paris, Missouri, and the chapter of FFA, Future Farmers of America, are tuning in to our live stream this morning. So C2, can we give them a warm online welcome? We are so glad you are with us. Wherever you're tuning in from, uh, all around Missouri and uh, all around the world, we're we're glad you're tuning in whenever you are watching this. And so we are continuing our series called Getting Rich. Everybody say, Getting Rich. Getting Rich, Getting rich yes. So leave it to your pastor to come up with titles like that for his sermons, right? Well, if you're joining us on Facebook, feel free to comment or chat. And students, if you're watching, if you have a Facebook, I know maybe that's for old people, but you can comment and chat, and our host would love to interact with you as you uh, tune in this week. So we started our Getting Rich series a couple of weeks ago. I know last week we were out because of weather. But two weeks ago, we started with the essentials of biblical stewardship. And so I just wanted to remind us what those were, because it really ties into how we look at money and what God is saying about riches in this world. So the essentials of biblical stewardship are this. Number one, God owns it all, right? Everything we have is his. It comes from him. Number two, I'm responsible for what he has given me, right? So I have a responsibility to do something with what he's given me. The third essential is I'm accountable. There will be a time at the end of my life when I stand before Christ and I'm accountable for the things that I was given in this life. And then number four, I will be rewarded accordingly to how I used what God gave me in this life. So the question is, if we're going to get rich, would you like to know how to get rich? I, that was a quick answer, yes. We all, I, I think many of us want to get rich. In fact, I think if you tune into any sort of social media, really, if you turn on the internet and all the ads that pop up and the sponsored uh, posts about, man, if you just do these three things, you'll be a millionaire in 30 minutes. You know, it's like, oh, I want to be a millionaire in 30 minutes. <laughs> Right, And really, they're just selling you something that someone sold them, and it's just kind of a pyramid scheme. But I want to know how to get rich. I think many of us do. I think we have to ask ourselves, what is rich, right? If you gave a teenager, right? Teenagers, if we gave you $1,000, would you be rich? Absolutely. I think you'd be like, yeah, I'm totally rich right now. If you gave a family of five $1,000, they'd be like, yay, we can eat for six days. (laughs) If you have teenagers, you can eat for three days on $1,000. So rich, it, 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 it's subjective. It's relative to your station in life. When you have no bills and no rent, having a thousand bucks is awesome. But when you got a big family or other things going on in your life, a thousand dollars doesn't go as far. You're not rich. Let me ask you this. How can you tell if someone's rich? By the way they dress, maybe. They wear the bling. They wear the right labels. Maybe by what they drive or the, the house that they live in. How many, how many things do they own? Maybe people act rich. Maybe there's a certain way you act when you're rich. I, I don't know. But would you agree with this statement? You can also fake, be, uh, fake being rich. And I think many people do a pretty, go- pretty good job of doing that. You can fake being rich. You can fake the labels. You can... You can uh, You can do everything it it takes to look rich, but not actually be rich. In fact, if we were to look at the the income of the average American uh, compared to their debt load, you would realize that most Americans aren't actually as rich as they act. (laughs) As Dave Ramsey says, act your wage. (laughs) Most people act above their wage. They spend more than they bring in. They're, They're carrying a heavy debt load. And so we can certainly act rich and not actually be rich. We have no assets, no actual money to our name. But here is the reality for most of us. I am rich. You are rich. We really are. I, even those of you who are, who are in debt, you really have a level uh, of uh, richness, if you call it that, or wealth that most of the world doesn't experience. If you live in America, you really are the top 1% in the world for the most part. But beyond that, here's something that I learned from uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle, if you know him from Life Church, I listen to him and, and read his sermons a lot. 
And he makes this statement. He says, I am rich. God is blessed with, with more than I need. I'm rich. I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. And because I have more, I will give more and do more. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a well-timed amen right there. Can you say this? I am rich. Say it again. There's a reality that we must come to grips with. I believe God has blessed us with more than we need. I'm rich. But I will not trust in those riches, but I will trust in him who richly provides all things. And because I have more than I need, I'm going to give more and do more. That's, that's a mantra I want to live my life by. And maybe you'll, you'll adopt that as well. So how do we get rich? How, many, how do we really get rich? Right? This is, I, I feel like this is where, the, where as a pastor, as a preacher, I'm kind of bait and switching you. I'm like, okay, let's talk about getting rich. And then they go, oh, but let's talk about biblically rich, which means poverty in reality. No, that's not it. I want to talk about getting rich. And the one way I believe in life we get rich is by, by being rich toward God. And you're saying to yourself, I knew it. I knew you were going to switch it up to be all spiritual. But there's something about being rich toward God that creates a wealth that doesn't disappear when you die. It actually is a true rich, the Bible says. So the Gospel of Luke, if you're familiar with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, he tells this story in Luke chapter 12. If you have your Bible, open it up, turn it on, it'll be on the screens as well, and take notes. Everybody say, Pastor, I'm taking notes. Thanks for lying to me. I feel better. But I believe if you're going to grow as a disciple of Christ, you need to learn to write things down and study them out. Don't just take my word for it. Take it to the Scripture. Go home and study it this week. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13. I feel like this moment is like a tantrum that this guy is throwing in the presence of Jesus. Listen to how this unfolds in chapter 12 of Luke, verse 13. Someone in the crowd says to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You want to know how I read that? I, I had sisters, I have sisters, I, and my sisters growing up oftentimes fought, and this is how it would sound. Teacher, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. Oh. That's how I read the Bible. I read, it's very active in my head. Verse 14, Jesus replies, man, who appointed me a judge and arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. That's where I want to start this morning. There's this moment that Jesus has with this unsatisfied person who has this envious attitude towards his brother. And Jesus wants us to start at this point. He says, guard against greed. Guard against greed. Greed. In fact, he says all kinds of greed. In the way the Greek writes it is all kinds of greed. It's a plural of greediness. And I think if we were to go around the room talking about what do you think greed means, we'd talk about people wanting more, more than what they have. They want more and more and more, never being satisfied. Greed to the point where you want what others have, not just what you have, you want what others have. Now, what you have is not enough. And what somebody else has should be yours. Greed shows up in a way of uh, feeling entitled. You owe me this. The world owes me. Someone else owes me. I deserve to have this kind of wealth even if I didn't earn it. Now in this, this situation, we aren't told who this brother is. He just says to Jesus, teacher, rabbi, tell me or tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. There's a couple of ways that you could read this. It could be his actual brother. In this regard, it might mean his older brother. If, if it's the oldest brother, the oldest brother got a double portion. The oldest always received a double portion of what the other siblings would have received. Why is that? Is it so that the other, because the firstborn is more greedy? No, it's because usually the firstborn had the responsibility to carry on the family business and to take care of the other siblings. There was a responsibility given to that firstborn that the others didn't bear. 
And yet this younger brother, it seems, is demanding that he get a share of what the older one has. Teacher, tell him to divide it with me. Jesus says, I'm not going to sit in that seat of judge or arbitrator. You got to work it out yourself. And then he warns about greed. Now, this could have been a a situation where he says, tell my brother, the the reference of brother for a, a Jewish person could have meant just simply another Jewish person. That they're, they're a brother by nationality, so tell him to divide what he has and give it to me. And this telling, when he says, tell him, Jesus, tell him to divide, that word means make him. By force, make him give what is rightfully his to me. Do you realize this about generosity? You cannot force generosity. I know there's this thought in our culture that you can, you can forcefully take from someone and give to another, and that's generosity. First of all, you can never be generous with somebody else's wealth. <laughs> that is not generosity. That's stealing. You cannot force generosity. All you do when you do that is breed contempt. You breed resentment, and you breed division. And we live in a culture that kind of teaches entitlement more and more. And we want those who are in authority, we scream to them, will you take from those who have and give to me who I don't have? I didn't earn, but I want it anyway. And we're taught to envy. Those who have must have gotten it in some ill-gotten way. They must, they must be corrupt. They must have gotten it by cheating. That's the assumption. And so we create this culture of envy. And we take this simplistic view that if someone's rich, well, Obviously, they have too much and they should give it to me. They should give it away. The only people that that we know for sure are corrupt are those who are in power and can take from you to give to others. It's always confusing to me when politicians start with zero dollars when they go in and they come out millionaires out of D.C. Anybody else have that? Okay, well, we'll keep moving. But the reality is this. People are rich and people are poor for many reasons. There's not one simple solution of why people are rich or poor. And again, it's all relative. But some people who consider them, themselves poor are only saying that in comparison to someone who may have much more than them. And for some reason in our culture, we're taught that greed is good if it has the appearance of compassion. If I'm greedy on behalf of somebody else, somehow I'm compassionate. No. You're only compassionate and generous in relationship to what you have and what you give. And so the command is not, don't be rich. But Jesus is challenging his disciples another way. He's saying, be rich in the right way. Understand what true riches are and understand how you should use your worldly wealth. He goes on in Luke chapter 12 in verse 16. Jesus says, He tells them a parable. He tells them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. This is perfect for FFA people. Anybody ever been in FFA, Future Farmers of America? Right? Salt of the earth kind of people. The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said to himself, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God says to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So how do we guard against greed? Jesus tells us right here. Be rich towards God. Be rich towards God. Everybody say that. Be rich towards God. Again, what I'm sharing this morning, I was so inspired by Pastor Craig Rochelle just challenging me, and I wanted to share some of the thoughts that he he gives as well. So how do I guard against greed in my life? I, I start by being rich toward God. That's how I can guard against greed in my own life. So how do we, how are we rich toward God? It sounds good, right? It's a good philosophy, a good principle. Oh yeah, be rich toward God. Well, how do I do that? How do you walk that out? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Number one, be rich in good deeds. Everybody say rich in good deeds. 
If you're watching online, throw it in the chat. Rich in good deeds. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. This is the apostle Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy. And he says this to him. Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides for us everything we need for our enjoyment. Verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. What does it mean to be rich? I mean, you ever thought about being so rich you don't have to work? I mean, that's a, that's, I think that's a goal for some people. I don't want to ever have to work. I just want to lay around and eat grapes that are fed to me by, you know, a, a, a llama or something. I don't know. <laughs> but here's, here's what... Paul the Apostle says, and it it bears, bears truth that Jesus spoke. He says, you'll never be so rich that you stop doing good works. In fact, that's one way you get rich, is you are rich toward God by being rich in good works. Be rich in, in good, you could say good deeds or good works, you wouldn't use, interchange those words. But if everything we have comes from God, and, and this scripture points it out, that he gives it to us to enjoy, Right? Like, we don't demonize those who are rich. We don't demonize those who are are in poverty. But we just recognize everything's from God. He wants us to enjoy it because he wants wants us to enjoy those things so that we might enjoy him. But this is no excuse for greed. Well, I was just enjoying my stuff. Well, at the end of your life, you need to show something for it. So the command is not against being rich, but to be rich in good deeds. It's, It's not a... Either or, either be rich, you can only be rich in, in possessions and wealth, or you can be rich in good deeds. No, Paul's saying you can be both. In fact, he's saying, Timothy, you need to tell those who are rich in, in this world by, by worldly standards that they should be rich in good deeds as well. In fact, they should be leading the way, he says, because he knows that material and financial wealth in this world, it can lead to self-centeredness and a, an arrogant view of the world. You have to understand a couple things about the, the phrase good works throughout Scripture, especially in the Gospels. That phrase certainly could, could um, encompass so many things that we might think of as good works in terms of serving other people and, and all sorts of good deeds that you might think of in your own head. But one of the things it, it, it was sort of a code phrase for, it was sort of slang for, it was the giving of charity. The act of giving charity was oftentimes simply called a good work. Like it was the good work that you could be judged on. So what are we talking about when we see being rich in good works? The Bible tells us to store up good works as a treasure. Think about that. You can store up good works as a treasure in the world to come. And hopefully that shifts what you think about as treasure in this world. The Bible consistently tells us that, that the treasure of this world will fade away, right? I, I used to have a history teacher who always said, you'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse, right? Because you can't take your stuff with you. And it's, it's biblical, you know, maybe not the hearse thing or the U-Haul, but, but here's the truth. Believers will one day, if you're a believer in Jesus and you declare faith in Jesus as a, as a disciple of his, you will one day be judged according to your good works or your good deeds. Now, I know there's so many Christians who are like, oh, wait, but doesn't the Bible say that we're, we're saved by grace, by faith in Christ alone and not by good works? Absolutely. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that. But listen, this is not a salvation issue. We're talking about making treasure that lasts. Jesus says life that is truly life is that which lasts into eternity. I mean, isn't that what we're all looking for is life that is truly life? And if you think about your experiences, think about the times in life where you were chasing something that you thought would bring you that. That satisfaction, that if I, if I just win that thing or I get that relationship or job or whatever it is, and you thought, that's what will that's finally make me feel like I have real life, true life. 
only to get it, and then you're like, well, this isn't it, so I have to go find more. And yet Christ says, no, that which is truly life is a greater treasure than you can simply have in this world. In fact, Jesus says the kingdom of God, a relationship with God through Jesus himself, he says, I'm the greatest treasure. He compares the kingdom of God like a treasure found in a field. He says, a man will find that treasure in the field and he'll go sell everything else that he might obtain that treasure. This is real treasure. Greed stores up treasure in this world that will fade away, but generosity, good works, stores up treasure in the world to come. Go back to that Ephesians 2 scripture I was mentioning. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Many people will say, well, pastor, I'm saved by grace through faith, not by works. And you're right. That's what Paul says to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 2. He says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This not of your own doing, it is a gift, not a result of your work. So you can't boast for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Say it out loud. For what? Okay. So wait, I'm confused now. What? So I'm not saved by good works but I'm saved for good works. Understand that. This is, this is critical as a disciple of Jesus. You are not saved by your good works. There's nothing you can do in, in, in terms of good deeds, good works, that will earn you salvation. But here Paul points out the truth about the disciples of Christ, that you are saved for good works. That this actually reveals the faith that you have. It says, actually, God prepares these good works for you in advance, that you might walk in them. The brother of Jesus, James, wrote his book and he said, hey, faith without works is dead. If you claim to be a follower of Christ or a lover of the one true God, but you don't have anything to back it up, your faith is as good as dead. It's useless. So we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. It reveals the active faith that we have. And that same good works, those being rich in good works, should point to God, not me. We don't do good works. We don't, do, we don't give to the church. We don't take care of others so that it points us. It should always point to God. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter 2.12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. He's writing to Jews, but Jews who believe in Jesus. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Jesus says himself in Matthew chapter 5. Let your light shine before men that they may what? see your good works, and glorify God, right? Everything should point to him. Everything that is good from us should point people to our hope in God. Listen, it's tax season. I don't know if, how many of you started your taxes. Taxes is not, paying taxes is not compassion. Don't confuse that. Many people will want you to think you're compassionate because you pay taxes to a government who may or may not take, take care of the needs of those who have not. That's not compassion, that's the law. <laughs> You're simply doing what you need to do. But that is not compassion. And don't confuse the two. Compassion is when you take of your own and you personally give. Taxes is not the way to do it. Taxes only lead to corruption. <laughs> but they do not point to God. When you give of yourself, when you are rich in good works, it should point to God. And in the end, it will glorify God through his church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, that we as God's church stir one another to greater works of compassion and generosity. He's, in fact, when Paul wrote this, he, or when, well, many people believe Paul wrote it, but when the author of Hebrews wrote it, He's saying this to the church. He's saying, you need to work together to stir one another up. This is why for us as a church, Kingdom Builders is such a huge part of who we are because our heart is global. We don't just see our, our four walls and our, our, our tiny influence of, oh, here, here we are in, in, in this uh, 3300 South Providence Road. No, we see, we see the, the world as our mission field, that our heart is global and we act local. And for us, that's the good works that we feel like God has called us to do as a church. Think about the influence you have as one person. Then think of the influence we have as a collective body of Christ. 
The impact we are making through Kingdom Builders is incredible. I love what happen, is happening through Kingdom Builders. The ministries that we support all around the world that are fighting human trafficking, that are feeding the hungry, that are bringing water to those who do not have clean water. Locally, we are supporting the Hogan House, a ministry in one of the poorest neighborhoods in our county. We, are, we have a mobile clothing closet that has become a great ministry. We're doing neighborhood outreaches. These are all parts of things that God is putting in the hearts of, of you, of our people, of C2 Church. Each week, you see people who are rich in good deeds because they're serving our kids each week, or in youth ministry on Wednesday nights, or they're standing at the doors greeting you as you come in, or they're in the parking lot freezing their butts off. They're serving warm coffee. Like All these ways are just simple ways to be rich in good deeds. The second way to be rich toward God is to be rich in relationships. Now that, that sounds simple, but I think it's actually much deeper. It's not just, I have a bunch of friends it's that I'm intentionally growing towards God with the relationships I have, and I'm rich in my relationships. My friend Nate Buxman, who's a, a missionary to the Mizzou campus through Athletes in Action, we were having a conversation one day, and he, he said this phrase, and I'll never forget it, stuck with me. He said, he said he had this revelation one day that he had a poverty of relationships. And I'll never forget that because I never thought about poverty in terms of relationships. And, and we, were, we were talking about the deep sub, subject of race relations when he made this comment, and it always stuck with me. And I thought about that. How many of us have a poverty of relationship? We're not rich in relationships, but we rather have a poverty of relationship because everybody we know and that's close to us looks like us, talks like us, acts like, like us, thinks like us, believes like me. Right? And you can see this probably in your social media pages, that the echo chamber of the media that you subscribe to, it just confirms what you already believe, right? And in our culture, we actually encourage people to cancel relationships with people who do not think or believe like them. That's, that's one of the saddest things that I've seen in culture that will bankrupt our culture is this idea of cancel culture. Because when you have a poverty of relationships, it leads to a poverty of perspective. But think about that. If, if everybody around me thinks and acts like me, I have a poverty of perspective. I don't see the needs of other people. How is God supposed to work through me if, if everybody I know thinks and acts like me? I have oftentimes challenged Christians. I've actually challenged young people as a, as a youth pastor to say, if, if all your friends are Christians... How in the world are we to reach the rest of the world? Now, it's not to say they should have great influence in your life, but certainly we should have a wealth of relationships that allows us to speak of Jesus to those who are far from him. And when you, have, when you are rich in relationships, you see the image of God in every person, no matter what they look like. It causes you to value every human life from conception to death. No matter what someone looks like, you value them. Why? Because they are made in the image of God. But if you lack relationships, if you have a poverty of relationships, you have a poverty of perspective, then you have a poverty of compassion. How can you pour out love on other people if everyone around you is like you? What happens when we do this? We start demonizing those who are not like us. Well, you know what those people are like. None of you have ever said that. I understand that, right? Oh, well, they deserve that because they don't think like me. They don't act like me. They didn't vote like me. It's easy to start demonizing others. But it's in relationships that we can grow and practice the two traits of Scripture that cause us to be rich in relationships, and that is hospitality and love. And I think the two are interrelated, but let me, let me kind of separate them a little bit. Hospitality is an expression of God's grace whereby I welcome and care for other people. That's hospitality. It's saying, how would I want to be treated and then I treat other people like that? One of the most important ministries we have here at C2 is our hospitality ministries. And it goes far beyond serving a hot cup of coffee and yum blueberry donut holes. I love blueberry donut holes, by the way. Just putting that out there for you. 
It goes beyond somebody opening the door for you and saying hi or waving to you as you drive into the parking lot. Hospitality, I really believe, stems from the heart and the character of God by which he welcomes us in. Though we may not deserve it, we are so much different than God, and yet he welcomes us in. There's a big sign outside our, our door, and if you don't, haven't visited our campus here, there's a big sign as you drive in, as you walk in under the awning, it says, you belong here. Why do we say that? Because we believe that's God's heart. That even if you don't believe like we believe, you belong in a place like this where you can receive the hope and the grace of God. Because I believe if we don't believe exactly alike on some of the things that are different, hopefully we can align in the hope in Christ. And that would be my hope for you. So hospitality is the, the fertile ground for the, for the seed of relationship to grow. Hebrews 13, the writer says this, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, to people who are not like you. For he says, by, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Paul writes in Romans 12, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This is how we become rich in relationships. We don't just walk into a building on a Sunday morning. We sit down and do our thing and get what we came for and then we walk out with what we got. Now we, we walk in and we say, how can I give this morning? How can I be hospitable? I know we're supposed to be six feet, but there's a way to engage people and love people, even six feet apart with your mask up. Sometimes you have to show people your real face real quick, like, here's my real face. So hospitality and love for one another. John 13, here's the words that John writes. He says, he says the words of Jesus. A new commandment I give to you, says Jesus, that you love one another just as I've loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is how we're rich in relationship. And here's the, here's the critical part. It's easy to love those who are like you. Isn't that true? It's easy to love my fellow Vikings fans, right? Because we share in disappointment and tragedy every year, right? <laughs> and Browns fans, I guess we could be friends too, I guess. But, <laughs> so, but do you understand? Like, it's easy to love people who are just like you. It actually takes zero love. You're not really challenged. It's when someone is different than you. Do you have to love them? That it actually, as, the, as your opinions grind against one another, love pushes you to find the greater calling. That, that unity is formed beyond that. This is the thing. Jesus didn't call us to be fond of one another even. No, I think there is a mutual fondness that is derived within relationship. But he certainly didn't call for tolerance. Tolerance to me is one of the most ungraceful words you can use. To tolerate something is like, a, like having a blister on your foot that you just wait till it turns into a callus and you don't have to think about it anymore. But love doesn't do that. Love is not calloused. It isn't tolerant. It goes beyond tolerance and says, I will embrace you because you were formed and made in the image of God and therefore I will love you and I will prefer you. And this is why he calls believers to love one another, to prefer and to place your own opinions below those others. This is why we at C2 are like, we're always pushing small groups. Like get into a small group of people. Why? Because it's hard to be known and to love in, in you know, a group of 250 or 500 or whatever our, our church is and two services. But when you're in a small group, suddenly you're like, you have to bump shoulders with people and you have to dig into real life together. And, and, and People have opinions that you don't agree with and you have to work through and study scripture together and come to consensus and, and, and learn to, to live together, right? Isn't that how it works? Because if, if you don't have to do life with other people, you don't need love. You certainly don't need hospitality. But you, again, will find yourself in a poverty of relationships. So be rich in relationships. And finally, be rich in generosity. This is how we can be rich toward God. We can be rich in good works because it blesses God's name. When we're rich in relationships, it blesses God's name. And when we're rich in generosity, it blesses God's name. Proverbs 11.25 says this, a generous person will prosper. 
Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Uh, what I was, I've been studying this topic for probably, uh, well, I'm always studying, but this topic I started about six weeks ago. I came across this article on, on uh, financemagnets.com. It's by a guy named Enrico Garzota, who is the co-founder and chief evolution officer of Forex Nation. This is like for bond traders and, and Wall Street kind of people. And as I was reading his material, I thought, I don't know if this guy's a believer, a disciple of Jesus, but listen to what he says. He says, the most successful people in the medium and long term are those who are the most generous in their business and personal lives. Material things, he goes on to say, can be recovered, but feelings of guilt, helplessness, and loneliness cannot be solved with money. If humans would be more understanding of and generous to others, the world would be a very different place. And that is why those who practice generosity, make it a part of their daily lives, experience an, an, experience an, an uplifting of their mental and emotional state and are generally filled with more satisfaction in their professional and personal lives. He goes on to say, people do not realize that giving without expecting something in return could be a competitive advantage as well as making one's outlook more positive. Studies have shown that the most successful people are generous. Now, his whole article is how you can use generosity to your advantage. And I get there's a, there's a how do I get more wealth, <laughs> more worldly wealth out of being generous? But they're actually tapping into a, a, a scriptural uh, philosophy or principle. You see, something that is true in Scripture is true whether you believe it or not. Do you, do you understand that? Like a believer who, a, a non-believer, someone who's not a disciple of Christ, who puts generosity into practice, will experience the benefits of Scripture because it's God's promise. Isn't that crazy that even people who don't believe experience God's promises and the truth of Scripture? How much more so should the people of God I don't know about a competitive advantage, but I do know when you are generous, it takes you out of the, the selfish world you live in, your own little cocoon of selfishness that all of us wrap ourselves in. And when you start to be generous, you start to care about other people and other causes. When, when you give to this church, when you give to, to C2, one, I believe you're being obedient. And this is, that, that whole giving talk is for next week. And if you're not here next week, I will judge you. I will totally judge you. But it takes you and causes your heart to be invested in something that's not yours. So you invest yourself in C2, or if you're a kingdom builder and you're giving money above and beyond your tithe, it's going out beyond the local church. You start caring about what's going on in the world of human trafficking and poverty and unfed children, things like that. This is why when you're rich in generosity, you are really stepping into the character of God. And this is why Paul commands Timothy to command those in his church. He says, command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share because in this way they are storing up treasure for themselves in the age to come. Gosh, think about that. When you share your time, your talent, your treasure, all those things that, that in, in this world, those three things, I think at the end of your life, you will be held accountable for, especially if you're a disciple of Jesus. When I, when I give my time and I give of my talent and I give of the earthly treasure that I have, what I do is I, I loosen the grip that greed has on me and I step into generosity and generosity breeds life into me. It causes, it causes my heart to grow and I become more compassionate. I actually have seen people who begin to give money under, they start to be more compassionate towards other people. Isn't that weird? But that's how money works oftentimes in our lives. So how do we guard against greed in our lives? I, if we took a poll right now, if I said, how many of you want to be greedy when you grow up? <laughs> you know, I was going to raise their hand. But if we are not careful, we don't guard our hearts against greed. That's what, that's the default setting of human nature. Did you know that? That's human nature. That's just default. We have to fight against that. And generosity, it, it kicks that default setting to the side. So how do we guard against greed? We are rich in good works. We look for ways to serve other people, 
to give of our time, talent, treasure. I'm, I'm, I'm rich in relationships. I'm entering into relationships that cause me to have to pray about the other person. I have to love them. And then I'm rich in generosity. I'm looking for ways that I can, can give and give and give. What will you do this week to be rich toward God? What's God saying to you in this moment? You just take a pause. Just, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Maybe there's several things that the Lord's put on your heart. Write it down. Send yourself a text. I'm not even sure how to do that. Send your spouse that text and tell them to tell you. What will you do this week to be rich toward God? How can you take just one step this week to be rich in good deeds, to be rich in relationships, or rich in generosity? You know, can I give you some homework? Well, I'm going to anyway. Lie to me and say you'll do it. Luke chapter 12, if you finish out that chapter, it's an amazing thing how Jesus carries this theme through the rest of that chapter. In fact, the next part of that chapter, he says, don't worry about what you're going to wear or about what you're going to eat. Like he, he identifies some of those things that we spend a lot of time worrying about. He says, don't worry about it. Your father in heaven already knows what you need. And he goes, look, I take care of the birds. I take care of everything in this world. I can take care of you. And he says, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be taken care of for you. And I think about how simple yet how complicated that is. Like seek first the kingdom of God. I'd seek the way God wants things done. If you seek how God wants things done, he's going to take care of you. Scripture promises that the children of God have never gone without bread. He'll always take care of us. And he ends that, that portion of the scripture by saying, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. And maybe that's what you need to examine this week. Where is my heart? Is my heart in my bank account, my, in the material wealth that I have? Because one day your life will expire. Or as Jesus said, your soul will be required of you. And you will be account, called to account for two things if you're a disciple of Jesus. You'll be, well, let me say it this way. When your life ends, you'll be held accountable for two things. In whom or what did you place your faith? To whom were you loyal? And whom did you give your allegiance to or what did you give your allegiance to? Not just what, did, did I go to church? Oh yeah, I claim to be a Christian. But whom did your life if we were to look at the whole of your life, whom did it declare loyalty to? Jesus or yourself? And if you're a believer, that second question would be, what did you do with what God gave you? What did you do with what God gave you? Can I pray for you this morning? And would you pray for me? Those watching online, we're so glad that you joined us. But my prayer for you this week is that God would reveal to you where you can take those next steps to be rich in good works, rich in relationships, and rich in generosity. I pray with you this morning. Maybe you're watching this morning. If you never placed your faith in Jesus, this is a great moment to examine where is my, what is my faith in or who is it in? And in the end, when I stand before God, will it give me life eternal or will I look back with regret? My prayer for you this morning is you take that step towards Christ this morning. And I think for all of us to take that step towards Christ, even if you're a believer in Jesus, to walk out what he has revealed to your heart this morning. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. For those who are watching and sitting in this room who feel far from you, Lord, by your spirit, we know you're drawing us close because you love us no matter what. And for those who, who've never placed their faith in you, perhaps this morning will be that morning where they say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you have a plan and purpose for my life. And I want to follow you. And I pray, Father, by your Holy Spirit, you'd inspire those who feel far from you to do that this morning. And Father, for your church this morning, would you cause us to be rich in good works and relationships and generosity? As you revealed this morning through your scripture, would you cause it to sink deep into our hearts and our minds that we might walk it out to the glory of your name, that the world would see our good works and give glory to you? that everything we do and say would point others to the hope that we have beyond this world to where you rule and reign. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.